Wow. <laughs> Blessing of little children. What a day after that split sermon by Mr. Fantau and then the, the children's choir and then Cole. This is awesome. What talent we have. We are looking forward to them all growing up and becoming members of the body of Jesus Christ, aren't we? Yeah, so thank all of them for all that they have done again. Let's thank them again. I think we all understand that we could make this statement. The feast is about families. I mean, ultimately, we're going to be born into the family of God, so certainly the feast is about families. And so here we have labeled this day as Youth Day. Therefore, we're going to talk about children. Now, as I begin this particular teaching, what I'd like for us to do is all of the sermonettes, all of the sermons that we have heard so far in this feast, I want you to take them and put them in your mind and bring them forward and remember them and think about them as I go through because every single one of them only emphasizes what I'm going to be saying in this teaching, in this sermon. There are a lot of sayings or mottos or whatever you would want to call it that are going around today in society that talk to parents that tell them that they need to talk to their children about certain issues that are happening in the world today. We have heard some of those issues, in fact many of those issues so far already in this feast. That's why I'm saying take all of those messages and put them here. Experts are saying that parents actually have a major influence on their parent. I mean, on their children. Now, we're not shocked by that, but they have to go to school and learn all of these things, and we just look in the Bible. But children actually do listen to their parents. And we also want to understand that children also listen in church. They pick up things that we may not get that they got. We might not know that they actually discerned this and they can explain it back. I'll give you an example, not trying to embarrass anyone. But a couple of days after the first day, a little girl came up to me and she said, well, she, she walked by and I spoke and she stopped and spoke to me and said, hi. And I said, do you know who I am? And she said, yes, you're Mr. Faulkner. And I said, yes. And she said, you gave the sermon on the first day. And I really liked it. She's probably 10. And I said, oh, did you hear it? Did you listen? And she said, yes. We all are going to be teachers, so we better learn. <laughs> and I went, you got it. Then I asked her, I said, well, I'm speaking one more time. And she said, oh, that's good. I mean, you know, a little, little child. <laughs> I didn't ask any of you, but she gave me permission. Anyway, and I said, yeah, I'm going to be speaking on Youth Day. And she went, oh. And I went, do you think I'm too old to speak at Youth Day? And she looked at me, and she went, no. And then she ran off. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to speak on Youth Day because one of the children told me I could. Now, Mr. Watson had already put it in writing, but anyway, it was going to happen anyway, but I thought that was cute. These experts in these studies go on to describe that parents, mom and dad, and even grandparents have a powerful influence on their children as they are growing up, and we really do. I want to mention some of those mottos, some of those sayings that go around that parents and children are hearing and they're to be talking about with their children. Talk to your children about drugs. Talk to your children about violence, about bullying. Talk to your children about the dangers of the internet. These are real issues that are going on, aren't they? I mean, if you're a parent, you're probably shaking your head, whether it's outside, but inside you're going, yes, 
These are real issues. Talk to your children about terrorism. When I grew up, that wasn't there. Well, neither was the internet, but... But I remember my parents having sayings, and they talked to me about various things, and I know that, and I understood that. And brethren, the fact is, all of these sound really good as they are, because they are. However, something is missing. So please understand, we will all have very little success in telling our children what to avoid if we have not already told them what to hold close to them, what to embrace, what is really, really, really important to them in their life. So a saying, a motto that I think we all need to have when it comes to our children or our grandchildren is talk to your children about God. That's what I've titled this message. Talk to your children about God. Now, I do understand to some degree I'm speaking to the choir. At least I hope I'm speaking to the choir. Because I want us to understand the point, brethren, all of us. The idea that parents need to influence their children is not a new concept. Because it is an everlasting principle outline in the word of God we see it in the pages of the Bible in other words so let's go back and let's consider some not all some of God's directives to his people the children of Israel because you see brethren God very specifically instructs we want to use the word command we can but instructs parents to talk and to teach their children about God. To talk to your children about God's way of life. And we're going to see this because it says that we're to do this. Go with me now, if you would. Please go with me to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. If you don't get any other verse, any other passage that, we, that I address here, at least get this one. In fact, I will even tell you here, commit this verse to memory and then put it in your heart and then actually live by it. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children and as an understood, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, I want us to notice the word teach. The Hebrew word is shanan, S-H-A-N-A-N. And the word means, now, when you say a word means something, more than anything, it's what it pictures. When it comes to the Hebrew language, it's a picturesque language. It paints a picture in our mind's eye. That's not how we, you know, we go to the dictionary, the Bible dictionaries, and we look up a word and we just read out, this is what the word means. There's so much more to it than that. But it helps paint a picture. This word that's teach, the Hebrew word means to whet, to hone, to shapen, And listen to this one, to pierce or to penetrate. It's telling us that we are to get whatever it is that we're to be teaching to our children, we are to get it into their minds. We are to get it into them. And we're to do this, we're going to see from a very young age. As it says, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you lie, you know, when you do all of these things. And so we understand that this is at every situation. This, the Hebrew language is very interesting because you can look up an actual word meaning. Then you can look up how it's used in the Bible. And then you can see, well, what's the sense of the word? The Hebrew language has... It's my way of stating it. I'm not saying this is technically what scholars would tell you, but it's my way of interpreting it. It has a sense of it or the meaning of it. So what is this telling me? This word is telling us that we are to teach them to our children. This is meaning it is, an, it is to be a formal instruction. We are to formally teach them 
instruct them, getting this information, penetrating into their little minds and into their heart. Then we notice the word talk. The word talk is the Hebrew word dabar, D-A-B-A-R, and it means again, A-G-A-I-N, or declare. And has some others, but I think those are the, will get the point that I'm trying to get across. The sense of this word is that it is to be done over and over and over and over and over, and you get the point. You're to teach them in a formal setting, and you're to talk to them in a casual manner. That would be what it would be, the sense of it. And a casual. That's what we just read. It says, and you shall talk of them when you're in your house and when you walk on the way, by the way or when you lie down or when you rise up. And so what we see is it's pretty obvious. This is to be done at all times and in every situation, not just church. But what are we are to teach them? What are we to talk to them about? Well, let's go up two verses and let's read what it is telling us. Verse 5. And you, meaning parents, it means all of Israel, but and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It starts with us learning to love God, putting it in us. And these words, which I command you this day, what words? That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And all the things that God is teaching us shall be in your heart. And now verse, 11, verse 7, it goes right into it. And you shall teach, you shall shun, and you shall formally instruct them, your children, diligently, which means with dedicated care. Unto your children, and you shall talk, you shall debar, you shall casually speak to them of this whole way of life of God when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Again, it is at all times and under all situations. In other words, it is to be a running dialogue all the time with our children. We are to use situations to teach them the word of God. We are to use circumstances and situations so that they will reflect on loving God with all of their heart. This is not something that we haphazardly do. In fact, God is so serious about this that he has even set up certain times and places where parents, yes, I said parents, it is not necessarily the responsibility of the ministry. Oh, yeah, we have the responsibility. We instruct everyone, and we talk and we include the children. They do listen. They do pay attention. Oh, I like your sermon. It's about teaching. That's a 10-year-old. Two days after the sermon, they get it. They listen. They may be coloring, but they're listening. But it's the parents' responsibility to instruct their children about the Word of God. And in particular, I'm going to read some verses here that shows us that we're to instruct them about the festivals, about God's festivals. Hebrews, no, I'm sorry, Exodus Exodus 12 and verse 24. Exodus 12, verse 24. We begin there. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. Now, when it says sons, it means sons, but it also obviously is referring to your children, to all of your children, boys and girls. And you do it forever. And it shall come to pass... When you become to the land which the Lord your God will give you according to he has promised that, he shall, that you shall keep this service. Now it goes on, it talks about one of the festivals and so it, it includes all of them but this is a generic one that I want to use. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what mean you by this? Why are you doing this service? Why do you do this? That you shall say 
It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Now that's specifically what this passage is referring to. Who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed their head and worshipped, meaning worship God. They were saying, like we heard the other day, all that you have asked, we will do. Now, we know they had problems doing, but that's not the point. They said, whatever you say, we will do. This is, this is the same kind of thing. They bowed their heads and worshiped God. They're saying, we're going to do this. We're going to tell our children, when they ask us about the festivals, the feast days, why are we doing this and why are we doing this other thing in church? We tell them. We tell them. We're to instruct them. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20. And when your son, when your child, boy or girl, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments? In other words, what does the whole way of life mean? What is God wanting me to do in my life? According to what God says, that's what they're asking. Which the Lord, our God, has commanded you. Then you shall say unto your son, We were Pharaoh's bondsmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, where's the focus? It's on God. It's on who God is. Who is God? Teach this to your children. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon the Egyptian upon the Egyptians, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his house before our eyes. And he, God, brought us out of there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. Now bringing us down to modern day, to our children today, back then it was, what is this? He brought us out of Egypt. Yeah, I've, I've, I remember telling my children and my grandchildren God delivered us out of Egypt and he brought us into the promised land and for us the promised land is the soon coming kingdom of God I've told them these things now you may look at them and they go they don't seem like they got it they got it I liked your sermon the other day two days later I'm, I, I'm making that as a point they get it they get it and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, listen to this, to fear the Lord our God. One of the major purposes of the Feast of Tabernacles. We're to be teaching this to our children. Yeah, now again, it's a minister. We use these verses to teach all of us. But the, but the instruction is to the parents. The instruction is, is to the parents. They, are to, they have a responsibility. For our good always, that he, God, might preserve us alive as it is this day, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God that he has commanded us. We teach this. We tell our children this. We're doing this because of who God is. We're doing this because God has told us to do this. We're doing this because it's for our good always. So a question that I think that we could ask is, why did God instruct parents to teach these things to their children? Well, in a heady way, you know, well, let's think about it up here, kind of intellectual, let's think about it. Was, it was for the specific purpose of provoking conversation between parent and child about God's way of life and about the things that God has done as it is compared to this false way of life that is offered to us through the world. They know what's going on in the world. Our children know much more about what's going on in the world than sometimes we even want to admit that they know what's going on in the world because they hear it, especially if they're in a public school. I am not against public school per se I really I really think that children should be taught by their parents <laughs> how can you do these things that he says to do it if they're six seven eight hours whatever it is under the care of somebody else again teachers doing a, a marvelous job not complaining 
But we're to do this as compared to the world. God even went so far as to suggest times for parents to discuss things with their children, even with their little ones, because that's what's implied here. Go with me to Deuteronomy 11 in verse 18. Deuteronomy 11 in verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between their eyes. Do you get the point that it is the word of God is always to be our focus, always to be in front of, if it is a front, and I know the Jews and we can ridicule them all day long. They took this as literal and whether they did it or not, it's not the point, but they literally did this. There are still extreme Orthodox Jews that do this. They write the Ten Commandments and it's put in a little box and it hangs and it's right here in front of them all the time. And we go, well, that's really extreme. Um, Do we have anything that's anywhere similar to that within our heart that we put these things in our mind like that? I'm not saying do that. I'm not implying do that at all. I'm just saying we need to question ourselves. But is this what it says? That you're to do this, you're to lay it up and to put it that it be as frontless between your eyes. And you shall teach them unto your children. Wow. If we as parents are to have the word of God in the very focal point of our mind, right in front of our face at all times. And then he says, and we're to teach it to our children. Do you think this is important? I think it's important. And you shall do this when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way. Oh, didn't we just read this? No, this is another, another verse. This is another chapter. But it's repeated. When God says something once in the Bible, it's important. When he says it two times, what do you think that is? What if he says it three times? Because he does. He wants us to get the point. We are to teach our children about God and about God's way of life, all the blessings, all the things that God has done. It is important. It is important. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, and he doesn't stop there, and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. There's a lot of ways of stating what he's meaning here, and I'm going to take this approach to it. God's words, his way of life, is to be obviously in front of us at all times. Now, as for show of hands, do any of you have a copy of the Ten Commandments anywhere in your house? We do. Do you have it by your front door? We do. Yeah, you're too much of an extremist. You actually believe... I was invited not to come back to a church one time because the the guy actually said, it's because he actually believes the Bible means what it says. (laughs) I do. I actually do. Now, I may be considered as radical, but that is what I believe. And so when it says to do this, I don't see any reason why we would not write them down and why we'd not put them by the doorpost. You know why it's there? So every time you go in and out and you see the word of God, you're reminded of it all the times. And you know what? Our children go in and out that same door. They will see it at all times, just like we do if we make it available for them to see it at all times. So we do. It should be obvious that God wants us and our children to be surrounded by his way of life. I cannot come up with any reason why that is not a good thing to do. God's word, his exciting, awesome, holy words are to have not a but the major focal point in our lives and in our homes. And obviously that would include with our children. And brethren, with all of this in mind, 
we need to remember something very, very important from God's perspective. Every child is a gift from God. Every child is a gift from God. Go with me to Psalm 127 and verse 3. 127 and verse 3. Lo, children are an inheritance. It doesn't, I mean, it, 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 the Hebrew word doesn't mean gift per se, but if you're going to inherit something, wouldn't you consider it as a gift? I mean, you know, because you didn't do it, you inherited it, somebody else did it and gave it to you. Well, God gave our children to us. They are gifts of the Lord, or it could be from the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. In fact, one of the men who was doing the blessing of the little children actually, in his own words, actually quoted this verse. Now, I don't know if he had that in mind when he was doing it, but that was the, these are the words that he actually was saying. It was the thought that he was getting across. They are gifts. Just like a, they are, you know, a reward from the fruit of the, you know, from the fruit of the uh, of the womb. That's what he said. Because this is what it says. It is always worth whatever the effort might be to do whatever it is that God has asked us to do for our children, to include them in whatever. Because, you see, God understood. God knew the influence that parents would have on their children. He planned it that way. He knew this from the very beginning. He always, always intended that the ways of right living would be passed along from father and mother to son and daughter as a matter of everyday life. I could read it, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. That's what he says. Therefore, we need to have a very clear understanding of our beliefs. How can you teach your children about God what we don't know? The answer is you can't. But we can learn. The more we learn, the more we can teach to our children all too often, the challenge is that many parents face is in order to discuss the things that they believe with their children, they have to know what they believe. When your son and your daughter come to says, why do we do this? Well, why don't you ask Mr. Watson? Why don't you ask Mr. Marina? Why don't you ask Mr. Ramakan? Whatever, when you get to church. I'm not opposed to doing that, you know, that our children ask them that. But why wouldn't we teach them? And I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I could be told don't come back, you know, because I'm too <laughs> radical and I understand this. And the mic goes dead, you know, somebody says, I don't agree with what he's saying, you know. But, but why can't we teach it to them? We, meaning the parents. I've already shown us it's our job. It's our responsibility. Why would we not want to be able to do that? And yeah, maybe the, maybe the minister can explain it a little more in detail. That's fine. That's good. But we can teach our children because God says, teach your children. Do this. Our children at very little ages, young ages I'm talking about, can be taught. You know, here's the thing. Satan can get into the mind of a very, very small little one and they start and they can believe things that are wrong from a very little age, right? Because their minds can accept that. You know what? Their little minds can also be taught and accept the truth. So why do we need to wait until they're, well, they're, well, we'll teach us them when they're older. Satan is already there. He's already influencing them. If they're breathing, if they're a child, if they're alive, they're already being influenced by, by Satan. We start early, early, early. And teaching them God's way of life. They should know things. I mean, at very little age, they should know things that we believe. They should know that we go to church on Saturday because it's the Sabbath. I'm not saying quoting scripture. 
I'm saying they should be able to tell somebody that asked them. What day do you go to church on? I go on a Saturday because it's the Sabbath. What do you mean it's the Sabbath? Um, well, that's what God said. Uh, well, what does that mean? Uh, I've told you all that I know. <laughs> I mean, okay, you know, but they know it. They know it. They know it. The, the earlier it's in there, the longer it's going to be there. And they're going to understand. They should also understand that we keep the holy days. If you don't think that they can come up with and understand and repeat the, the seven annual holy days or, and or festivals, have you on a word of God, you're mistaken. They can. If they can count to seven, they can repeat the holy days. And we don't think they're so little that they should be taught these things. They should be taught these things. They should be taught these things. Our children also, this is where some may say, now you're beginning to meddle. <laughs> this is, the children are also to be taught to memorize the Bible. Memorize Bible verses. Again, if they can count, and they can tell you, and they can count, they can memorize Bible verses because it has a meaning to it. I remember one time one of our grandkids, when he was real little, my wife was teaching and he was saying, you know, and he would, I mean, real little. And so, so what is five plus five? And he didn't get the concept down, but he always got the right answer. He would say 10 sometimes. And what he was meaning by this, I don't understand why it is, but it is. And that was okay, because he knew what the answer was. Five plus five is ten all the time. The word of God is always the right thing to memorize. I mean, it was kind of not stated, but inferred the other day here, or at least questioned in our minds, what if Bibles are taken away by law? And go, oh, that'll never happen. Really? Really? We're naive to believe that we're not living in a world that will outlaw Bibles. So the more people that have it committed to memory, the better we're all going to be. Because that's going I'm, to, I'm saying we live long enough, time goes on long enough, I'm hoping that it doesn't. I'm praying that thy kingdom come like now. But if it doesn't, how are we going to teach our children if there are no Bibles? Well, there's always going to be the Internet. What makes us think the Internet is going to allow Bibles on them? I mean, we live in a horrible world. But we're blessed because we have God and the knowledge of God with us. But can we explain what we believe to our children? We need to. We need to. Because again, that is part of the intention that God had back over in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. You shall teach them. They didn't have a written Bible. They taught them. They memorized the word of God. What do you think Paul, the apostle, he pretty much had the entire Old Testament, because that was the only Bible, committed to memory. He didn't carry a Bible around with him. Well, well, let me look it up. I think it's over here in, uh, I think it's over here. No, no, it's not in 12. It's, oh, here it is in chapter 13. He had it committed to memory. What's wrong with our children committing as much of the Bible to knowledge? I'm not talking about his punishment. I'm talking about his rewards about a holy way of life. This is the God that we worship and he's good and he's awesome and he loves you and he wants us to live a holy way of life. He wants to live the way of life that he wants us to live because he's always good, he's always right, he's always awesome, he's always on target. So let's memorize this. In fact, the apostle Peter encourages us in this very thing over here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God. Set him apart. 
Set the Lord God apart in your heart. Probably a better word for us today would be in our minds. Could I actually use the phrase as the maybe the intent of it is? Is that memorize all about God and put it in your mind. I'm not saying that's what the words actually mean. I'm saying could it could the sense of it be something like that? I think it's something like that. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Well, you asked this question, but let me run get my Bible. What is he saying? Always have the answer ready. You gotta have it. You gotta have it in your mind, you gotta have it in your heart to be able to answer the question. So, as parents and grandparents, we need to ask some questions. Are we prepared to give an answer to those who ask questions of us, even if it is our own children? Are we ready to give them an answer? Are we taking advantage of every teachable moment that we have to pass along to our children what we have learned about God's nature and about God's way of life? Are we building within us and within our children a foundation of truth that will sustain them in the storms of life that are ahead of them? Are we teaching our children about God? After all, any way you look at it, it is good for them and it is good for us. Because if we have it and we can teach it to our children, is it good for them? Yes. Is it good for us? Yes. Parents, please understand we are either going to prepare our children to follow Jesus Christ or to follow the world because there's only two ways. We're either teaching them to follow Jesus Christ or we're not. And by not teaching them, we are teaching them there's the way of the world. Oh, I would never do that. Well, it's either, it's, it's either one or the other. Let me give you some what I would consider to be very thought-provoking quotes that I'd like for each one of us to think about. Who said it is not the point. I don't have to give them credit here. The first one I have is, if you don't teach, if we don't teach our children to follow Jesus Christ, the world will teach them not to. It was outlawed. The Bible and prayer outlawed in this country in public school in 1962-63 school year. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. The second one is, children are great imitators. So give them, <clears throat> so give them something great to imitate. Teaching kids to count is fine, but teaching them what counts is better. Do you like these? Thought-provoking, aren't they? And I have one more. There are many, many others, just what I have. The most precious jewels you'll ever have around your neck <clears throat> are the arms of your children. Now I want us to take a look at three more passages about teaching our children about God. Go with me first of all to Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. Probably many of you have this one committed to memory. Well, that's good. Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's mature or when he's old or mature, he will not depart from it. And that's true. And there's a lot of ways to explain this. Well, it's talking about from an agriculture. It's talking about from a business point of view. It's talking about a lot of things. This is a very broad base. But it has to start with us. It has to start with us as parents and grandchildren at a very young age, which is what is implied by the verse. Biblical Hebrew is what I would consider to be a picturesque language. It paints pictures for us. 
then we have to stop and think about it and analyze, well, how do I apply this into my life? They paint these pictures. The word train is from a Hebrew word that literally means to put something in the mouth. Or another aspect of it is to give to be tasted. It's very picturesque, right? And we go, what is that saying? Well, it, was, it is referring to, it was used from a point of view of when a parent and sometimes a nurse, don't get, don't get grossed out here, but this is practices that are done. Still, I looked it up. It's still even done in many Middle Eastern countries. When a parent or a nurse would chew food first to give it to their infants to introduce to them solid food. Now we can see the picture of that, right? So what is that saying? In other words, it is give them elementary instructions and you do it when they're young. This is what this verse is telling us. And when they've got this in young, elementary teachings, that's the first principles of God. Another one. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligent lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. So he's setting us up and saying, don't forget what you've seen. In other words, this is the word of God. This is what it is. Don't forget it. Remember it all of the days of your life. That's another way of saying it. And then it says, so taste them to your sons and to your grandsons. That's what it says. Don't forget it so that you can teach it to your children. Or another way of saying is, you're not going to forget it if you're living it as a way of life and you're instructing your children. It's to help us to help them, and that in turn helps us. You're not going to forget it if you're teaching it to your children, if you've really got it in there, and if you really are believing this. And you go on in verse 10, it says, specifically the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Hor, those when they received the, the law of God. When the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear the Lord all the days that they shall live upon the earth. Purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that they may teach their children. We learn it to teach our children. Do we get it? This is the point. This is what this verse is telling us. One of the reasons for learning is that we can teach it to our children so that we won't forget it. Because if we're not learning it and we're not teaching to our children, is it possible for us to forget it? No, the answer is probably we will. If we're not really seriously digging in and studying the Word of God every day, every day, every day, because that's what we're to be telling it to our children. Every day, every day, every day, right? That's what it said, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. In every situation. I have one more verse here. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 19. I want to read this one from the Common English Virgin. Version. Teach them to your children. We've read this. I told you it's more than one place. Talk about them all the time. Whether you're at home or walking along the road or going to bed at night or getting up in the morning. So we ask the question, do you think that teaching and talking to our children about God is something important to God? I do. I do. I believe it's important. I believe that God says it's important. I also want us to understand, brethren, that mom and dad and grandparents, that I believe. I'm a believer in this. I actually am. I believe that if we actually would take every one of these words, these verses of these words, that we have seen here today and we live them in our lives and we put them into 
the mind and the heart of our children. I believe that the God who fashioned our sons and our daughters, our grandsons and our granddaughters, I believe that the God who fashioned them into his own image, I believe that he knows exactly how to draw them near to him if we're doing what we have been commanded to do or as we have been commanded to do what we have been commanded to do as parents. Am I saying that God can't do it another way? I'm not saying that. I am saying, why would we want it to be another way? We're so involved in our lives. It's much more than feeding them and clothing them. It is teaching them the word of God in every moment, in every situation. <clears throat> I also believe that when, <clears throat> when that I cannot see God working, he is. I believe that the effectual Fervent prayer of a righteous mom and dad and grandparent avails much. Do our children need our prayers? All the time. All the time. So, I watch. I wait. I pray. I believe. I believe that God, if we are teaching our children about who and what is God, talking to them at all times, I believe that the God we worship is willing to turn the world upside down. <coughs> if he needs to, to turn the hearts of the children. I believe that. Talk to your children about God. I want to end with the ironic blessing again. It applies to our children. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, speaking to Aaron and to his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That includes our children as we are teaching them God's way of life. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. God bless each one of you, mom and dads and grandparents. You have a, you have a hard job, but a beautiful job. God bless you all. Talk to your children about God. <clears throat>